Welcome to This Is Getting Old, Moving Towards an Age-Friendly World. I'm your host, Melissa Batchelor, and on today's episode, I'm going to be, well, we're going to be talking about financial caregiving, and this is a special series that I'm doing um, with uh, Cameron Huddleston, who's joining me today, and today we're going to be talking about how to talk to your parents and your siblings, kind of the why, when, and how. So welcome, Cameron. How are you today? I'm great. Thanks so much for having me on the show. Well, I appreciate you being here. This is a topic I've wanted to talk about with you for what, probably a year. And so probably we're finally, <laughs> finally getting to do it. Um, so maybe before we get started, um, tell everyone a little bit about yourself. Sure. So I am a personal finance journalist. I have been writing about money for more than 20 years. I wrote a book called Mom and Dad, We Need to Talk, How to Have Essential Conversations with Your Parents about their finances and i was a caregiver for more than 12 years for my mom who had alzheimer's disease i was a hands-on caregiver for about four years and then when she was in a memory care facility i was her financial caregiver and i also oversaw all of her care so that's that's me in a nutshell Right. And I think that one of the, when you and I connected, one of the things I found so interesting is that when we think about being a caregiver, I think a lot of people think about kind of the, um, the physical caregiving that happens, you know, um, but caregiving really encompasses a lot of things, including finances. And a, a lot of the information in your book, I'll have to tell you, like, I think I read it like in a day and I was like, this is just such great information. Um, so let's talk a little bit about when you know you knew that you were because because your book is about your personal experience and kind of some of the pitfalls and lessons learned um so when did you realize like what were some of the signs that your mom needed more help with her finances so i'll just start by saying that i did not have detailed conversations with my mom about her finances before she started experiencing memory loss. And that was a really big mistake on my part. I had an opportunity, I had plenty of opportunities to have the conversation. I just didn't realize it was a conversation I needed to have until I saw that she was going to need help with her finances. And so when it was, initially it was pretty easy to ignore the signs that she was experiencing memory loss because she had hearing loss. And I could, you know, when she would ask a question and I would answer her and she would ask it again, I would tell myself, oh, it's because she didn't hear my response. And that went on for, I don't know, several months, maybe even a year, but it was when I was visiting with her and we lived in the same town. So I was at her house one evening and uh, she asked me if I wanted to go see a bench that she had bought for her back patio and so we went and we looked at the bench we came back inside and a few minutes later she asked me again do you want to see the new bench i just bought and my heart just sank because i knew this was not a hearing issue she had forgotten that we had just gone outside and looked at this bench and i thought oh my gosh something is clearly wrong i've got to get her in to see a doctor we've got to figure out what's going on Um, as a financial journalist, I also knew that because she was forgetting things that we needed to take steps to make sure I had the legal right to be involved with her finances and her healthcare decisions. And so I encouraged her to meet with an attorney right away to update all of her legal documents, her will, her power of attorney document that named both me and her sister as her agents to make financial decisions for her, when she was no longer able to herself and also to name me and my sister, her healthcare power of attorney to make medical decisions for her. She also updated her living will that spelled out was sort of end of life medical care she did or did not want. And so that was really the first step that I took to get involved with her finances. And the attorney encouraged us to go ahead and go to the bank and let her bank know that I had been named her power of attorney, take that document with us. And so We did do that and that was a really good idea because banks and other financial institutions, even though they're not supposed to, they can make it difficult for caregivers to get involved with their loved one's finances, even if they have that legal document, that power of attorney document. 
especially if that power of attorney document was drafted and signed years ago. They might refer to it as a stale power of attorney. They're supposed to accept it, but sometimes they'll say, well, this is too old. You need a newer document, or we have our own documents that need to be signed. And so if you can go with the parent and the bank can see that this is the person, the parent or the older adult trust gives that financial institution that sense of security because they don't want to be giving someone the right to access a client's you know, accounts if they're going to go in and take advantage of that person. And so I went with my mom to the bank together. You know, I can't even remember now. It's been so long ago whether the bank required us to sign additional documents. But that's how I started to to get involved. And then I slowly eased my way in as she needed more and more help. I didn't just take over right away because she didn't need help with everything. And I didn't want to get pushback from her and and that you know would have left her in a worse situation if she wasn't willing to accept my help at all and so like i said i kind of ease my way in um but you know there were lots of signs that she needed help i mean she was writing checks left and right to every organization that asked for money and i didn't want her to give away all of her money so i would go through her mail and sort those donation requests from the bills and then i was able to get online access to her bank account to kind of watch from behind the scenes and see where her money was going and to make sure that she was handling her money responsibly. You know, with time I took over it more and more of the financial yeah. tasks that she wasn't able to handle. Yeah. So I think it's really interesting. I mean, we talked to people about getting a healthcare power of attorney and a financial power of attorney. And it never really occurred to me that as soon as you get those documents to go to the bank and, you know, there is a lot of elder you know, abuse and fraud, you know, that does happen. So I do think that's probably a really good thing to do. Plus it, it, it starts that conversation. So when you first realized that your mom was having trouble with her memory, and again, this is a slow progression. And so by the time she forgot that you, that she'd already shown you the bench, that's pretty moderate in the disease process. And so there's going to be a lot of things that might not quite jive right with someone like with a, with an adult child t talking to a parent. And so I, I think it's normal for people to dismiss those things, but you do need to pay attention because the sooner you get involved and actually have a diagnosis, the easier all of this becomes. So, um, so you're doing kind of what, what I think most people do. I mean, I'm thinking to myself, like, this is how I would handle it with, with my parents. So Talk to me a little bit about some of the lessons learned by doing more of the slow entry <laughs> <laughs> into trying to untangle her finances as an outsider. So the biggest lesson that I learned is that I should have had conversations with her while she was still healthy because I had to play detective. I had to figure out what sort of accounts she had and it was difficult. I, in fact, there was one account that she had it was an investment account that i didn't even know existed until she was already in a memory care facility she had been living with me for a couple of years so her mail was coming to me and then once i moved her into memory care got a notice from this company saying that her account was going to be turned over to the state is unclaimed property for lack of activity there was fifty thousand dollars in this account that I never knew even existed. And so if I had sat down with her while she was healthy to get a list of all of her accounts, then, you know, we wouldn't, I wouldn't have almost lost $50,000 of her money. You know, luckily got the notice and was able to, as her power of attorney, get access to that account and use that money to pay for almost a year's worth of care in a memory care facility. But if I had had conversations with her sooner, I wouldn't have been playing detective. There wouldn't have been things that were overlooked. And so I really want people to realize that these conversations should be happening before there's an emergency. I was lucky that she was actually able to sign those legal documents because she, like I said, was starting to forget things. And so we met with the attorney and the attorney determined that she was still competent enough to sign them. But if you are no longer mentally competent, you can sign those documents and then someone is going to have to go to court 
to be to essentially petition the court to be named a conservator to manage financial matters to be named a guardian to handle health care matters and um, that's essentially putting your parent on trial to do that and it can be very time consuming very expensive can create all sorts of emotional trauma for you and your parent going through that process and so i got lucky that she was still competent enough to sign those documents even though she was starting to experience memory loss um but you know like i said i was because it, go so, ahead well so it's, it's really the difference between either as uh, an older adult with an adult child that you trust it's either putting yourself in the driver's seat or turning it over to a court system to decide for you and so to me i mean that's probably one of the biggest gifts that happened this with you and I having this conversation can do for people is to say, as soon as you think there's a problem or as soon as there is a diagnosis, like the financial part of their life needs to be addressed. And so many people are afraid to even talk about money. So, um, so like, so how did you even start that conversation with your mom? That meeting with the attorney really helped because there was that unbiased third party who was telling us that we needed to go to the bank together to let the bank know that I was now my mom's okay. power of attorney. I think it's really important to get that third party involved if you have a parent who is reluctant to let you get involved. Maybe it's the doctor. So maybe you notice that your parent is experiencing memory loss and you go with your parent to a doctor's visit, that your parent is examined, there are tests that are done, there comes back a diagnosis of, you know, some form of dementia, maybe it's Alzheimer's disease, maybe it's something else. You know, the doctor didn't say anything to us about financial matters that my mom was going to now need help with her finances. I just knew that as a financial journalist. But if you're there in the doctor's office with a parent, that's a question that you want to ask. Okay, mom has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Does that mean that she is going to need help with money matters now? What sort of assistance is she going to need? Ask those questions to the doctor so that the doctor, that third party is telling the parent, yes, because you have dementia, now your financial decision-making ability is impacted. In fact, you've probably already been making mistakes with your finances because research shows that those with Alzheimer's disease and related dementia show a pattern of missed payments up to six years before there's an actual diagnosis. And so, you know, if your parent has already been diagnosed, they're probably already making mistakes, which is something that I discovered years later going through my mom's records that she had missed some medical payments and there were collection notices that she was receiving. I had no idea that this was even happening. And so, you know, getting that doctor, maybe it's an attorney, you know, maybe it's an accountant, maybe your parents are already working with a financial advisor. And so the financial advisor can't share your parents information with you, but you can call up the financial advisor and say, hey, I'm concerned about mom. I think that she's starting to forget things. Can you please encourage her to share some information with you? Having someone else other than the child encouraging the parent to let the child other or another family member get involved is a really good way to you know get the parent to cooperate because they're not always willing to listen to that child it's a role reversal it is and i think that this is where kind of individual personalities come into play you know and kind of the, all the family dynamics that were there before before the you know the memory problem um so what you're describing is kind of an ideal situation where, you know, the parents beginning to have some memory issues, you know, there's already a good relationship there. You know, you're explaining to her, like, this doesn't mean I need to take away your autonomy and your independence right now, but I do need to help you monitor these things so that we can avoid, you know, you know writing a check for 50,000 to, you know, a scammer, because that is, the, you know, the greatest leasing of America right now. Um, so what do you recommend for people? Like, I, and I, and actually, I would say, like, as a provider, if a family member asked me that question, like, do they need help with their finances? I think I would, you know, I think it's hard to know, 
when that is happening, except to say that, you know, because, because you do now have this diagnosis, which is a diagnosis of exclusion. And the fact that when you're, um, once you get to, by the time people get to like a primary care provider, they are in the very moderate stages. So to say, you know, this is, if you, are, you know, unless it's very, very early, you know, that th- this is always going to be the case. Like as soon as that diagnosis is made, you need to be thinking about this. But I do agree using that, uh, the physician or an, attorney, an accountant or a financial advisor. I actually told my accountant one time, I was like, you probably would be one of the first people to notice a memory problem in your profession because of just a change in someone, you know, over just a short span of time. So if you have a parent where you maybe don't have such an ideal relationship, you know, what are some some strategies that you would recommend to kind of get the conversation started? So as I mentioned, ideally you have this conversation before there are any health issues, before there's an emergency. And so there are a variety of ways that you can bring it up. You can simply ask about what if scenarios, what if something were to happen? What if you were in the hospital and I needed to make sure your bills were getting paid? How would I do that? Are your bills being paid automatically or are you writing checks every month? That's really a simple way to start the conversation. I had a friend who did that with her mother. Her mother was living on her own and her mother said, you know what? I never even thought about that. Thanks so much for asking. And she went and made a list of all of her bills and how she paid them, share that with her daughter. And that led to more conversations. You could talk about your own financial planning experience. You know, hey, mom and dad, I just um, had a will drafted, power of attorney, healthcare proxy, all these documents are, they are now in my house, in this particular drawer, in my home safe. Let your parents know where they are. Say, you know, I want you to know in case something happens to me. By the way, do you have these documents? Where are they? And if they say, yes, I have them, then you, like I said, you need to say, where are they? Because it's not going to do you any good. Yeah. If you and how do I get to them? How do I get Because if they're in a, them? they're at the bank in the safety deposit box, that doesn't really help people. <laughs> no, especially if you can't find the key. No, you need to be able to access them. Or maybe you tell your parents, look, I just, you know, I just got a new life insurance policy. Or, you know, maybe it's even, hey, I found this really awesome retirement savings calculator online and I realized I wasn't saving enough for retirement. And so the conversation starts by asking them about their retirement. You know, how did you plan for your retirement? Are you, you know, did you have retirement savings account? Are you getting a pension? Is it just social security? Or if they haven't retired yet, you know, what are your plans for retirement? You can ease your way into the conversation. You can share a story about someone you know who had to get involved with their parents' care, maybe someone who lost a parent, they didn't have a will, and it created all sorts of headaches for the family members who were left behind and they were grieving. And on top of that grief, they're dealing with the fallout from a lack of financial planning by the parent. And so there are lots of different ways to start this conversation naturally. And when you do this before there's an emergency, then emotions aren't running as high. People can have these conversations and they can be calmer when you wait for an emergency to have the conversation. Yes, emotions are going to be running high. The last thing people want to talk about financial matters. And so it's going to be harder to have a calm conversation at that point. Now, people, (laughs) human nature, though, you know, being as it is, we're not going to probably have these conversations because we think they're awkward. And then we see like I did that my mom was forgetting things. And then suddenly I had to have the conversations. What you don't want to do is put your parent on the defensive. Hey, mom, and you're forgetting things. So that means I need to be managing your finances for you. Well, I mean, she's still remembering a lot of things, too. And so if you're telling her that she isn't capable of handling her finances, you're likely to put her on the defensive and she's gonna shut down. She's gonna push you away. You have offended her. And so instead, what you're gonna wanna do is look for those tasks that your parent needs the most help with. And most likely it's going to be either avoiding scams because if they're experiencing memory loss, their financial decision-making ability is impacted, they're at much greater risk of being scams or, or, and also, also, 
paying those bills because like I said earlier, if there is memory loss, they're probably having trouble staying on top of their finances and making bill payments on time, or maybe they're paying the bills twice. And so maybe it's as simple as saying to them, hey, you know, I have found that a great time saver for me is having my bills set up to be paid automatically. Would you like me to help you do that? And so then you're gonna sit down with them at a computer and you're gonna log into those accounts. So you're gonna see where they're banking. You're gonna see what sort of bills they have and you're gonna help them set up these automatic payments or you know, warning them about scams. Hey, I just got a phone call from someone claiming to be with the IRS and they told me that I had to pay back taxes. I had to get a gift card to make this payment. I just want you to know that this is a common scam. So you're gonna share scam red flags with them. You know, you get a call from someone claiming to be with a government agency. You get a call from someone asking you to pay with a gift card or a wire transfer. And then maybe you say, hey, these scams are so common. Anyone can fall for them. You know, you make a list of these red flags. You share articles with them and then you encourage them. Let's let's set up some account monitoring on your account. Yeah. Let's make sure I was going to say, getting, uh, yeah, make sure you're getting you're alerts. talking about though. Right. But there's only so like if someone truly is in the moderate to the later stages of this disease, like their ability to retain all that great information that you just wanted to share. Make a list, write it down for them. <laughs> right. And that will work for a while too. But I, but I do think that the monitoring piece um, and I and I like the the the, um, the idea of doing with the person instead of saying I'm just going to take over and do all of this, you know, to do as much with them as possible. Um, but just to be aware that the whole reason you're having to do this is because they have memory problems, and so the monitoring is and making sure making sure that the bank sends you the alerts like at, at a certain threshold. Like I I have this set up on my phone, you know, at over fifty bucks, yeah, I'll get like a an alert. So, um, right. And so they might, um, you know, so you can do that, help them go log onto their bank account and set up those alerts so that they get notified and maybe they're willing to let you also get notified Enter your email address, your phone number, so that you can also get those text messages when there are transactions on their bank account, when there are transactions on their credit card account, sign them up for credit and identity monitoring, put a freeze on their credit report so that new credit lines cannot be open in their name. This is really important. I mean, um, you know, there, there are services out there that can do that account credit identity monitoring. Um, one of them that I work for one of them, it's called careful and you can, you know, link your parents' bank account, credit card accounts, uh, financial account, uh, investment accounts, and then credit, Careful is going to monitor for all sorts of money mistakes and signs of fraud and unusual transactions. And it can alert the parent. It can alert you whenever it spots anything unusual. So there, there's technology out there that can make the job of monitoring a parent's accounts easier. Right. And not overly invasive. Right. So right. what about what about the parent who, you know, um, hasn't saved enough for retirement or has debt and they're you know, really ashamed of how they've managed their money over their lifetime. That is one of the common reasons why a parent might be reluctant to let a child have information about their finances to get involved with their finances because they're embarrassed. Um, but the thing is, if there has been any sort of diagnosis, you have to get involved. If you're not at that point yet where you need to get involved, but your parents are reluctant to have that conversation, it's really important when you attempt to have these conversations that you are coming from a place of love and concern and that you are not passing any judgment on your parents. You don't want to say anything like, look, I'm worried that you're not going to have enough money for retirement. I'm worried that I'm going to have to pay for your care. You don't want to start the conversation that way. You simply say, look, I want to know what your wishes are in case something does happen to you so that I can follow those wishes. And so you can start the conversation that way. And maybe it's not so much about their finances, but those final wishes, you know, what, when, when you, when you die, what do you want? Do you want a burial? Do you want cremation? 
Maybe you start the conversation that way so that you're not talking about their lack of planning for retirement. Um, but you're, you're going to have to get to that at some point. And so you, you ease your way in. And like I said, you're not, you don't want to pass any sort of judgment on your parents. You want to let them know, look, it's okay. Most people have not done a good job of saving for retirement. I am trying my best to save for retirement, but I know how hard it can be. And so let's start having a conversation now so that we can have a plan. We can figure out what resources you have and what maybe you can do now so that if there are, if you do need long-term care, there's a way to pay for it. If there's not going to be enough money for you to live comfortably in retirement, we can make a plan now. There can be some changes that can be incorporated so that your money will last longer. Okay. So thank you for all of those great tips. Um, I, today we've been talking about you know, talking to your parents. Um, we didn't really get so much to the sibling part, but we're going to get to that in the next one. Um, kind of the why, when, and how to have these conversations. And just wanted to recommend your book again called Mom and Dad, We Need to Talk by Cameron Huddleston. And so join us uh, next week where we're going to be talking about from the perspective of a parent who maybe doesn't have a memory problem yet um, or not a memory problem at all, but how do they talk to their adult children and what do those children need to know? So uh, join us next week and I'll be right back with Cameron. Thank you for tuning in to This Is Getting Old, Moving Towards an Age-Friendly World. I'm your host, Melissa Batchelor, and if you'd like to learn more, you can check out my other episodes on my YouTube channel by either by subscribing and ringing the bell to get immediate notifications when new content comes out. In addition, you can also find the audio version of the podcast on Amazon Music, Spotify, iTunes, and Stitcher. Please feel free to leave an honest review because more reviews mean more awareness of the podcast and helps us move towards an age-friendly world. If you have a comment or a question, you can visit my website, melissabphd.com. Go to the Contact Melissa tab, and you can leave me a voice message. You never know. It might just include your question or your comment in an upcoming episode.